Good evening. Um, great to be able to share the scriptures with you again this evening. Um, and of course, we're preparing to enter Holy Week, um, tomorrow being Palm Sunday. And um, we're going to be gathering as a church, both in person and online, to celebrate this um, incredibly special and important day. Um, now, I mean, that, that in and of itself is interesting. Um, in fact, it's only um, in John's Gospel that palms are referred to. Um, but certainly there is the triumphal entry of Jesus into um, Jerusalem and uh, the reception of him, recognition uh, that Jesus is the Lord who is worthy of honour and he is the one who saves. Um, and that's the, you know, begins uh, for us within our, our Christian tradition everything of um, Holy Week. And um, here we are um, at, at the beginning of, of this. And you know we're going to make reference to it in a moment or two. Um, but within uh, both the Jewish and, and the Christian, although albeit more in the Eastern Christian traditions, um, today um, is a significant occasion. And it's quite relevant, in fact, to our reading for the day, because in Romans 9, um, within the passage here, uh, we have both um, some stuff to wrestle with in terms of um, God's will, our own free will, the election, um, and, and all of these kinds of things that perhaps we wrestled with a bit yesterday. You can wrestle with it again today if you'd like. Um, but then we come also then to this, um, uh, the, the references to, to Jews and to Gentiles, which um, in actual fact have, have less to do with um, where you come from and how you've been brought up in your religious tradition, and more to do with whether you receive the grace of God by faith. So firstly, just to think about um, this sense of um, God's election, his choosing, and, you know, there's a, there's a problem that's been set up just towards the end of yesterday's reading in verse 19 um, that says, who can resist God's will? And um, I suppose we might uh, we might want an out, mightn't we? We might want an answer to such a question that says, well, actually, you can. <laughs> you know, you can by doing this or, oh, but he's not talking about you or anything like that. But actually, the scriptures make plain to us here. Um, the, the creation is God's, you and I, we're made by God and he has a right to deal with and determine his creation as he sees fit. Um, Paul um, uses the analogy of a potter with the clay, um, making, uh, you know, out of the same lump a vessel for honourable use and one for dishonourable. Um, and, you know, these are difficult concepts, difficult doctrines to wrestle with. Um, and yet... Um, what I would urge you is um, not necessarily to make this kind of the end point of your of your wrestling of your of your work with the text. Rather, come as it were under the sovereignty of God, His work, and and let us um, move through to determining what God wants to do um, in and through us. Now. What we have here is moving then on, uh, you know, saying that, that God can do with people what he wants, um, which I suppose is an ultimate reality. It's hard to argue with that. Yet then the Bible teaches us both what he has been doing by means of his great forbearance and grace with the Jewish nation, Jewish people. And then because of that, what God is doing with um, those who aren't Jewish, the Gentiles. Um, and, and what we know is that God has provided means of grace, the prophetic work and word that tells us that he is um, a, a wonderful saving God. And then also he is enabling that for those who aren't um, of the Jewish nation. Um, and, you know, that there is difficulty within this. Um, there is, uh, you know, there is problem. We'll come to that in a moment. Um, but there is possibility and joy and we find that as is quoted in verse 25 and 26 from Hosea um, the other prophet a lot of this passage quotes Isaiah um, but here Hosea um, those who were not my people that's you and me non-Jewish I will call my people says God 
and her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. Um, not only that, but you know, if our faith is in God through Jesus Christ, we get to be called sons of the living God. What a promise. Now, we know that it is through the Jews that comes the, the story of redemption, that it is Jesus the Jew who uh, becomes the means of our salvation. Um, and then the salvation comes, yes, first to the Jews, but then to the whole world for all who will believe. But then Paul kind of draws back in, um, again, now quoting Isaiah, and he talks then about now that's that's God's trajectory, that's God's plan, that's God's sovereignty. Look, he is in charge. He can do what he wants with whoever he wants. Here's the wonderful work that he's done. But then Paul then comes to us and he says, but many will not believe, many will not choose, many will not have faith. He says many actually of the Jewish nation, um, they come to Jesus and see him as a stumbling block, a stone, a rock of offense. And he is too problematic. Um, for them to have faith you know talking back through I remember Paul is a, a Jewish believer in Jesus but talking back through his history his national religious history he talks about how it is just that a remnant is saved and that was the experience that many went far from God many were carried off into um, into exile but a remnant returns and, um, you know, th there is tragedy within this, but it makes the point very plainly, doesn't it? Um, that it is by faith. It is by faith we are saved, not of works, such that um, a, a Jew would, who might think that somehow the law or circumcision that we talked about before might just in and of itself be a means of salvation is no better off than a Gentile who not having the law, not having circumcision, yet still places their trust in God by faith in Jesus. And and this is a wonder to us. I said today is a very precious, important day. Um, where we are now is, is the great or the big Sabbath. Um, it's the Sabbath that immediately precedes Passover um, within the Jewish tradition. And, um, and, and really everything now leading up to Passover um, is of enormous significance if you're not familiar with Passover obviously it's it's the time when um, the Jewish people were going to be led out of captivity in, in Egypt by God um, and it was going to be the culmination of the plagues that God had poured out upon um, Egypt and it was going to be the horrific moment of, of death going through the land and yet as they took that spotless um, lamb and and the sacrifice was made and the blood was on the lintel of the door, um, then the angel of death would pass over um, God's people, the Hebrews, the people of Israel, and they would be saved and they would come out of captivity and into freedom. That's hugely significant, not only for them in that moment, not only to preserve the Jewish nation as they would be then the means of salvation, but also foreshadowing the work of Jesus Christ, who is led like a lamb to the slaughter. Um, you know, there is this immense provision of God for his beloved people, the Jews. It is absolutely astonishing what he did and continued to do for their salvation and preservation, and so that he might work his ultimate good purposes in and through them. And even though all of that wonder is true, here Paul says, yet many would not believe. It's an incredible tragedy, isn't it? An incredible tragedy. And I mentioned also then within the Christian tradition, the Eastern Christian tradition, um, this that is the, the great Sabbath in the Jewish tradition is also then Lazarus Saturday uh, within the Eastern or the Orthodox Christian tradition. Lazarus Saturday. Um, recollecting the fact that Jesus came to one who was dead and brought him to life. And again, it was something that foreshadowed um, the resurrection that was going to be of Jesus himself. And I just perhaps kind of, you know, as I'm reading these words and contemplating them on this day of all days, I'm considering how it is that God might do absolute wonders. God might provide the law, God might provide the Passover, he might preserve, he might save, he might do everything that is necessary and in his sovereign will work his good purposes. And yet, we 
need to be brought to life. Just like Lazarus was. You know, go back to your gospel stories and check it out. Just like Lazarus, though he were dead, he was brought to life. Because, you know, God can do everything. But unless we ourselves are recipients of his new life, then it, it is something that it is external to us. And, you know, we might we might see everything wondrous going on around about us. God might do everything that's necessary. And yet, if our faith is not in him, if we're not brought to life, then, well, Paul concludes in saying, the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it. We who were dead, just like Lazarus, have come to life because of faith, a righteousness by faith. But that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed it in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as it were, as if it were based on works. And here's the contrast. You know, it, it really doesn't matter how wondrous God is in your circumstance or in your history or in your cultural environment. Um, if it is something just of works, something dead, and, 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 and if Jesus then comes into that and becomes just a, a stumbling block that doesn't fit in, then it, it, there's no salvation. But if, like Lazarus, you're dead <laughs> and you accept it, and it's not about what you're doing, but it's about God bringing you to life, then there is hope and there is freedom. Come on, let's pray. Jesus, we want to be people who come to you acknowledging that without you we're dead. We don't want to have any kind of sense of self-righteousness, of works-based righteousness within us. God, we are so very thankful for the Jewish nation, for the your chosen people through whom you have worked the wonders of salvation. And Lord Jesus Christ, we're so thankful for Passover and we're so thankful for the foreshadowing of your glorious work upon the cross and in your resurrection. In this all, though, God, we say, it's not about what we're doing. It's not about practices or behaviours or any of these things. It's not even about the law in and of itself. It's about the fact that we are dead and we need to be brought to life. In sin, we are dead, but in you, Christ, we are alive. Bring us to life, we pray. Amen. If you need to be brought to life in Jesus, would you send us a message? You can WhatsApp us here on this page or um, get in touch by one of the ways you can see there. And, and we would love to help you find new life in Jesus. God bless you.